All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our second part of turning up, of talking about uh, learning. Uh, we're going to talk about operant uh, conditioning today. We're going to break this up into two parts because um, um, it's a little bit of a longer topic, so I want to focus uh, on it in a smaller portion. So this is the first part of this for operant conditioning. So our objectives and standards to explain operant conditioning and how it applies to learning and analyze how operant conditioning works and, pur and its purposes. And take a moment there, please look over the standards. And our desired result, how does operant conditioning work in terms of learning? Some vocabulary here, uh, operant conditioning, a way of learning in which a certain action is reinforced or punished, resulting in corresponding increases or decreases in occurrence. Uh, a reinforcement is a stimulus or event that follows a response and increases the likelihood that the response will be repeated. A primary reinforcer is a stimulus that is naturally rewarding, such as water or food. And a secondary reinforcer is a stimulus that becomes rewarding through its connection with the primary reinforcer, and this could be money. Again, sometimes the terms are a little confusing. Don't get frustrated. You know, we'll go over it a little bit more in, in the lesson. So some continued vocabulary. Uh, fixed ratio schedule is a pattern of reinforcement in which a set number of specific correct responses is required before reinforcement can be obtained. Variable ratio schedule is a pattern of reinforcement in which an unpredictable number of responses are required before reinforcement can be obtained. And then fixed interval schedule is a pattern of reinforcement in which a specific amount of time must elapse before a response will elicit reinforcement. So we just kind of talked about earlier this week, uh, classical conditioning. So there's another way to learn, or classical learning. There's another way to learn, uh, which is operant learning. And that is the process of learning from the consequences of behavior. It's called this because the subject or the operant operates on or causes some change in the environment. And this re is a result uh, that is created that influences whether the operant will react or respond in the same way in the future. Behaviors will either repeat or be eliminated in order to receive rewards or avoid punishments. I put a picture up there of a dog and a bone. So think about this, maybe you have a dog in your neighborhood or in your, uh, you know, maybe you know of a, you know, the stray cat or dog in the local area that, you know, people will put food out for these animals outside their homes or outside their businesses. And these animals will continuously return for the food. Okay, so um, operant, can, learning is a perfect example of this because at first the animal may be a little shy to go up to the door or go up to the business for the food, um, but eventually the animal will keep returning to that area for the food. So again, it's behavior. It's a consequence of behavior. The animal has learned now to go to that area for uh, the food. There is a difference between these two learning styles, and the difference is, is how the experimenter conducts the experiments. For classical conditioning, um, the experimenter presents the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus independent of the behavior of the participant. So those things are presented independent of the behavior. Operant conditioning requires that the participant engage in a behavior for a programmed outcome to occur. So think of this another way. Classical conditioning is more involuntary behavior. Um, the dog, you know, reacting to the food or the tuning fork, you know, we're f kind of making the animal uh, react a certain way or training the animal or the person to think a certain way. That's involuntary behavior. We're training them to react a certain way, such as with the tuning fork and the food. Operant conditioning is opposite of that. It's involuntary behavior. We're not forcing the animal to, you know, go back to that business or go back to that home for the food, right? Uh, the animal is learning on its own free will that it needs to do that to receive the food or receive care or money, whatever the case may be. Now, the process of reinforcement. The major player in this, and the person who's very important in this, was a psychologist by the name of Burris Frederick Skinner, uh, or B.F. Skinner, more commonly known, and he was very well known for his studies of operant conditioning. It was his belief that behavior is influenced by a person's history of rewards and punishments. And what he did is he trained, or what he called shaped, rats to respond to lights and sounds in a special enclosure called a Skinner box. 
So here's an example or a drawing of Skinner's box. Um, so a rat was placed inside the Skinner box, and the rat has to learn to solve the problem on how to get food to appear in this little cup down here, right? Okay. Now, a rat would typically explore the box, and when it moved towards the bar, which is over here, the rat has its hand on the bar, you can kind of see, when the rat started to move towards the bar, the experimenter would drop food into the cup. Now, following many attempts of this, the experimenter would then only drop food into the cup if the rat pressed the bar, which you can kind of see here a little bit better. So now we're forcing the rat to press the bar to uh, get the food. So then the rat begins to realize, hey, the food isn't just going to magically appear in this cup just as I walk towards it. I need to push this lever or this bar down and to receive the food. Food in this experiment is the reinforcer, okay? Um, and this is what we know as reinforcement, okay? Again, it's the idea of a stimulus, such as the food, uh, or an event like pushing the bar down to receive the food will increase the likelihood of behavior being repeated again, which the rats did. They learned that they needed to push the bar down uh, to receive the food. Now, examples of reinforcers for humans could be money. Money is a big part of what we want in the world, right? Uh, social approval, so maybe having friends or being accepted by society or even extra privileges, like maybe, um, you know, I don't know, you, you get a raise at work uh, for doing a certain good thing. There are two types of reinforcers, positive and negative. Um, and both of these reinforcers can result in a change in behavior, okay? Positive reinforcement occurs when something is added after an action, such as the rat receiving food. Um, another example, the dog receiving a treat after you ask for its paw. So maybe I tell a dog, sit, and I say, paw, and, you know, the dog will then, you know, give me its paw. Again, the dog, the first couple of times you do it, and if those of you who have had pets in the past may know this, when you first have a dog, it's, you know, you have to train it to give you its paw um, or to sit down or to lay down. Um, you know, then maybe you give it a treat, like a bone or a toy or something like that. So this is a positive reinforcement because after you give the dog the toy, the treat, whatever the case may be, um, this, the, you know, the dog remembers, oh, if I give my paw, I'll get a treat in the future or I'll get my toy in the future. So this is positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement occurs when something is taken away after an action. So, for example, a parent tells a child that they cannot watch television until their homework is completed since they do not have good grades. It's not ne necessarily doing something bad, but it's taking something away. And the child will then learn that, hey, I have to work harder in school, I have to do better on my homework, so I can receive that reward or that reinforcer of watching television again in the future. There are different types of reinforcers. Most are known as primary, <coughs> excuse me, or secondary reinforcers. Uh, reinforcers that satisfy a basic biological need. We consider food, water, water, shelter, uh, things like that are known as primary reinforcers. These are the things that we, you know, we're in, our brains are ingrained to want and need. We know we need food. We know we need water, uh, you know, to survive. So those are primary reinforcers. We'll do whatever we need to do to basically get them. Secondary reinforcers can be paired with primary reinforcers through classical conditioning. Okay, and we'll explain this in a little bit because experiments have been done to prove how secondary reinforcers work. Follow this line, okay? We're gonna go uh, down this way, kind of like a maze almost. We're gonna go boop, 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 and we're gonna go over here, okay? So, there was an experiment that involved poker chips and chimpanzees. This was by Wolf in 1936. Chimpanzees were given poker chips, okay, in his experiment, um, in the experiment. And now, poker chips, chimpanzees really don't have any purpose for them, right? They're not really fun to play with, they're not edible, they really can't eat them. However, when they pair the, pro the poker chips with um, the desire or want for food, um, this changed. So when used with classical conditioning and operant conditioning, uh, things began to change. The chimpanzees were given poker chips to use as quote-unquote money to get food, okay? So the monkeys were shown that they should use these poker chips to put into a slot to receive food. 
So experiments involve the chimpanzees pulling down on a bar uh, to receive poker chips. So once they were shown to use the poker chips to, to get the food, they then learned that they had to pull down on this bar, poker chips would come out, and they learned that poker chips then had to be put into the machine that would release the food. Okay, so very common type of thing to think about, you know, um, again, using something like primary reinforcers such as food, and then the poker chips would be a secondary reinforcer. And what the experimenters found out is that chimpanzees, I find this kind of kind of cool, they would actually save and steal the poker chips from others in order to receive the food. So again, the best example of a secondary reinforcer for humans, as you can kind of see in this example too with chimpanzees, is money, because it can be used to buy things such as food or other items. Reinforcement schedules. Uh, an important factor in operant conditioning is the frequency and timing of reinforcement. Continuous schedules of reinforcement involve reinforcement of behaviors that occur every time. So, you know, every time I push down on a lever, like, a like, like the chimpanzees or the rats were, I get food, right? So every time I push that button or I push down that lever, I get food. However, you might think that this is the best way to improve behaviors, but it's not, which is kind of interesting. It's not the best way to improve behaviors. The best way to improve behaviors is a partial schedule of reinforcement that occurs intermittently that allows for improved behaviors over time. Continuous reinforcement behaviors only occur when the reinforcement is given all the time, so it's better to have a partial schedule of reinforcement. And here's some examples of different types of reinforcement schedules. The fixed ratio schedule. This involves reinforcement that depends on a specified quantity of responses, such as rewarding every third response. An example of this could be a student who receives uh, a good grade after completing a certain amount of work. So if a teacher says, uh, you know, hey, if you do these three projects, um, I'll give you, you know, I'll, I'll bump your grade up to a B uh, or whatever the case may be. OK, um, that's going to make the student uh, want to do better in school and it's going to change their behavior. The variable ratio schedule, this doesn't require a specified, can't talk today, sorry, specified amount of responses, uh, but changes from next time to the eat, uh, from each time to the next. Uh, an example of this would be people who sell items door to door or even survey people. Salespeople and survey people don't know how many doorbells or phone calls they have to make before uh, they make a sale or before someone agrees to take their survey. But again, they keep going and it changes their behavior. Um, and so this is an example of a variable ratio schedule. <coughs> a fixed interval schedule. Um, the first correct response after a specified amount of time is reinforced. Example of this could be you know that your teacher always gives a test or a quiz on a Friday. You know that the test or quiz is coming. So what do you do? You don't always study throughout the week. Some of you may, um, but some most people, including myself when I was in college sometimes, you would study the night before or you study the day before a test or a quiz. So that's changing your behavior. You know that, okay, I'm going to have a quiz on Friday. I'm going to have a test on Friday. I don't need to study for it on Monday necessarily. I'll study for it Thursday night. So that's a fixed interval schedule where you know that it's every Friday. You know it's coming every Friday. Um, so you know that you need to study Thursday night or Thursday during the day. And a variable interval schedule is a time at which the reinforcement, I'm sorry, time at which the reinforcement is given changes. So example, maybe you call your friend on their cell phone or their home phone, whatever the case may be, and you get a busy signal or, you know, they don't pick up, you get their voicemail, okay? So you wait a couple minutes and then you call them again and then you get the voicemail again. So you wait a little bit longer and you call them a third time and finally this time maybe they pick up, okay? So you don't know that when you call your friend they can't speak the first time but and you, you might think, ah, maybe I'll call them back, they'll pick up, they won't. Um, but again, this is a changing your behavior, okay? So you might wait 10 minutes the first time, you might wait 20 minutes the second time, uh, maybe you wait five minutes after that, you know? And so this is the time at which reinforcement is given changes. All right, so 
Um, if you have any questions about this or you're confused, please let me know. Please reach out to me. We're getting to some of the more difficult topics now and some more difficult content as we get into memory and learning and thinking. So again, if you start to struggle, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to meet with you during office hours or another time because um, some of this stuff can be very confusing. I don't want you to get frustrated with it, okay? So just try your best in the questions that follow, and I'll uh, hopefully talk to you guys soon.